Okay, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Trudy Sandmeyer. I'm the director of the Heritage Conservation Program here at the USC School of Architecture. And this is a combination of um, a class that is normally held tonight, uh, Architecture 555. Um, which is about the conservation, uh, international heritage conservation. And so we sort of liberally interpreted international heritage conservation to include tonight's topic uh, because it all fits together uh, in the big global scheme of things, So um, as, as you will see. So I am thrilled to have you all here, um, whether you are a current student um, or a uh, an interested member of the public. We're always happy to have um, new folks uh, come to campus, and I hope it wasn't too hard to find us down here in the basement uh, bunker down here. Um, so we are really excited to have Dr. Ned Kaufman here tonight to, um, to talk about uh, extraordinary prizes in ordinary places. And so um, I wanted to say thank you to a few people who really helped make this possible. Um, we actually have uh, some sponsors who helped uh, defray some of the expenses for tonight and to um, make possible several events here on campus in, a, in addition to some other things that are happening here in town. Um, we are taking advantage of uh, Dr. Kaufman being here in LA to uh, run him around all over the place and have him talk to various people. Um, so we are excited that he's here tonight to, uh, to share his, his thoughts with us. Um, so we have a few partners that I want to thank. Um, obviously the School of Architecture, the USC History Department here on campus, um, and especially uh, Elizabeth Edwards, um, who, is, uh, who helped sponsor tonight's event and is here with us. So let's give her a round of applause. We are co-sponsoring this with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, as well as the University of uh, California Riverside Public History Program. And um, we have a couple of media sponsors who helped us get the word out, and I know a few of you are here uh, in direct response to that, which is the Los Angeles Conservancy and the Santa Monica Conservancy specifically. So thank you to all of them for helping make tonight possible. So. Um, I, the professor who actually teaches this class um, is uh, Vinayak Barney, and unfortunately he had to fly to Panama today, so he's not here. <laughs> um, but we're, we're soldiering on without him, so uh, again, the students who are here for the class need to sign in uh, before the end of the night so I can work with him on that. Uh, but I wanted to say a special thank you to him for allowing us to um, to come and spend time with him tonight. And then um, one of our own very own alumna uh, here at the USC Historic Preservation Program, as we were formerly known, um, is Allison Rose Jefferson. And she is the person who really sort of spearheaded coordinating all of this um, and, and making it happen. So um, I wanted to th say a special thank you to you for helping to uh, wrangle all the various forces to make this happen. So, uh, and she's going to introduce our speaker tonight. So thank you for coming. We're delighted you're here. Hello, everybody. I'm Allison Jefferson, and I graduated from the Historic Preservation Program in 2007. And I'm now working on a PhD in historic preservation, uh, in uh, public history at uh, at UC Santa Barbara. I worked in the field for a couple of years and I decided I wanted an expanded platform. So that's, I say that to some of, I say that for some of the students here who have, uh, you know, many decisions to make about where they want to go in the future with their, their work. How many people uh, in the room are in the historic preservation program or in the architecture school? Okay, and how many students are, uh, how many people here are students in other programs uh, on campus? Are you in the history department or? No, I went to the school, but I went to UCLA. Okay. I'm in the school. Okay, okay, and then general public, how many people are from outside the campus? Okay, just was, was kind of curious uh, to know who our audience was. 
Okay, well, Dr. Ned Kaufman's work is uh, at the vanguard of historic preservation, thought, and activism. His uh, scholarship and teaching uh, and practices confront outmoded conventions and inspire us to question uh, traditional methodologies for saving and interpreting historic sites. The need for enhancement of the inclusion of African Americans and Latinos and Asian American experiences and interpretations uh, and identification and protection of sites uh, of historic significance and consciousness and drawing diverse communities into, Ameri into the American mainstream preservation conversations are themes that uh, Dr. Kaufman uh, confronts uh, directly in his work. Um, further, he uh, is also involved in the implications of emerging transnational uh, group identities for interpretation and advocacy in the broader cultural landscape uh, and historic preservation. Uh, Dr. Kaufman uh, is a principal uh, of Kaufman Heritage Conservation and an adjunct professor presently at, uh, in the Historic Preservation Program presently at Columbia University. And he served before as the director of um, uh, Historic Preservation at the Municipal Art Society of New York, where he led the campaign to, perfect, to protect the African American um, burial ground, the Audubon Ballroom, uh, Ellis and Governor's Island and other historic sites. He's also a founder of uh, and co-director of um, Place Matters in New York City, not This Place Matters, which is the National Trust uh, program, which they stole the title from him. Um, <laughs> and uh, he uh, has also uh, done extensive uh, international research and training programs with Rafael Vignola's Architects. He has a couple of books out, which I'm sure some of you are, are familiar with, um, Place, Race, and Story, uh, Essays in the Past and Future of Historic Preservation, which came out uh, not too long ago, um, uh, Pressures and Distortions, uh, City Dwellings as um, Buildings and um, uh, uh, critiques, which is another book that came out recently. He has other uh, publications as well, and he's done many uh, histories for um, uh, on national uh, historic sites. He's advised the National Trust on sustainability policies, and he is a voting member of the ECOMOS uh, uh, Intangible Heritage Committee. I give you Dr. Kaufman. Thank you. Th thank you all. Um, a special thanks to Allison for doing so much to arrange this, and uh, Allison for your own hospitality and kindness as well, and, and to Trudy, uh, to USC. I was going to do a whole round of thank yous, but, but let me just reiterate what Trudy said. What Trudy said, uh, and, and because we, we have a lot to talk about tonight, so I'm, I'm going to uh, get right into it. The, the, um, the extraordinary thing about ordinary places is that most of the time we, don't, we look at them, but we don't even really see them. Uh, we take them for granted precisely because they are ordinary. But as I hope to show you today, um, these ordinary places just might be the most important and the most valuable of all. And the benefits of protecting them, the social and environmental benefits of protecting them are really extraordinary. Uh, to begin our talk, we need to fly from the West Coast. We're gonna cross Oklahoma, Arizona, Oklahoma, um, Tennessee, West Virginia. We're not going to Washington. We're not going to New York. We're going to land on this little muddy, watery patch of island uh, just off the coast of Maryland. It's called Smith Island. It's a place that's known for fishermen and for crabs and not much else, except for one very important thing, which is this. This is a Smith Island layer cake. No one knows how or when or exactly where the Smith Island layer cake originated. Uh, Islanders say 
it, it's always been here. A well-known local chef writing a cookbook considered it so ordinary she didn't even bother to put it in her collection of local Maryland recipes. Another local expert said, we never even thought about it until Elaine F. came, uh, uh, came asking. Elaine F. was a researcher from the uh, Maryland Arts Council, Maryland State Arts Council. And Elaine F. saw something special in the Smith Island layer cake. She saw a genuine expression of Smith Island local heritage wrapped up in something that residents took for granted. And uh, today, as a result of that chance encounter between Elaine F. and a layer cake, the Smith Island layer cake is the official state dessert of Maryland. We would probably owe it a round of applause, but, um, <laughs> but, but uh, some of you, I sense, are scoffing at the idea of, a, of an official state dessert. But I think that might be because you're actually envious. Because <laughs> according to most published sources, California has no official state dessert. And in fact, according to most published sources, California has no official state food at all. That's despite the fact that last year, Lieutenant Governor um, Newsom actually did proclaim a state fruit, vegetable, nut, and grain. So why are people ignoring California? Well, maybe because the Lieutenant Governor didn't go through the proper legislative process, so maybe that means that the state fruit, vegetable, nut, and grain are not actually official state fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains. But, but anyway, for those of you who are state food envious, I want to do a little quiz now and see how many um, you can get right. Does anybody know the official state historic vegetable of Utah? Not the official state vegetable, the official state historic vegetable of Utah. If I show you a picture, maybe that will help. Does anyone know what that is? Close. Close to sugar beet. Okay, so that's the official state historic vegetable of Utah. How about the official state vegetable of Washington? Mm, vegetable. Vegetable. You would be right if I'd said fruit. It, hmm? The Walla Walla sweet onion. Not just any onion, the Walla Walla sweet onion. How about the state vegetable of New Jersey? This is really easy. It's, not to, it's the Jersey, it's the Jersey tomato. Uh, how about the official state fruit of New York? That's the apple. Actually, the official state fruit of Washington is also the apple. There is some competition there, but more than one state can have an apple, I suppose. Did you know that Massachusetts has an official state muffin? <laughs> no, it's a good, it should be a cranberry probably. But no, the official state muffin of Massachusetts is actually the corn muffin. Now, in 1988, Oklahoma shot to the front of the pack and designated an entire official state meal. <laughs> now this, yeah, this I have to read to you because it's a long menu. Fried okra, squash, cornbread, barbecued pork, biscuits, sausage and gravy, grits, corn, strawberries, chicken fried steak, pecan pie, and black eyed peas. Actually, I think it might be several, several official state meals, but this is the way it's presented in the, um, in the, in the authoritative sources. So what does, what does this all tell us? It tells us this. Pretty much all of these foods are really ordinary. They're plain, hearty, and unpretentious foods. And so obviously whoever chooses historic state or state official state foods has learned this important lesson that what's really special about a place's heritage may be just exactly these ordinary everyday things. By the way, that may be the reason why California's uh, state choices are being ignored. California chose the artichoke and the avocado for vegetables, and I love both of them, but maybe they were missing the point that they're supposed to pick something really ordinary. Anyway, this lesson about the importance of the ordinary in the formation of local heritage is something that we in historic preservation apparently still need to learn. Preservation treatises always tell you 
They start out by telling you how to find what's special, unusual, distinctive, or different about a place. In other words, precisely the things that are not just ordinary. Because the theory is that that's the basis on which we make preservation decisions. We pick out the special, the uh, exceptional, the unique, the non-ordinary, and we preserve that. And it's been like this basically since the beginning of our discipline. Uh, back in the 19th century, uh, a building had to be special. It had to be a stunning work of art, like Chartres Cathedral in France, which absolutely is a stunning work of art. Or it had to be an absolutely mind-boggling gem of historical importance, like Versailles. And the theory was that these were the places that we really needed to protect, and the rest was, un the rest was unimportant. It was background. It was unimportant in background precisely because it was just ordinary. Well, th this approach has brought many successes over the years, but it's also, brought, it's also produced some rather disturbing uh, results. In Philadelphia, for example, back in the 1950s or early 60s, that green space is the, the, what used to be the guts of the old historic city of Philadelphia, and the National Park Service ripped it all out to build a proper vista for what was considered to be a really important historic memorial here, um, which is Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence was signed in the foreground. And that is a really important historic site, beyond a doubt. Uh, it wasn't just old monuments that were given this treatment. New monuments were given it too. The very same time, the city planners and architects of St. Louis were doing the same thing to build Saarinen's Great Arch, uh, memorializing the westward movement of uh, Anglo-American civilization, and to provide a proper setting for the really exceptional monument, the guts of the old city, which was actually part of that western movement, were ripped out. W well, um, you know, today most most of us probably look at these and other many, many other cases of this, and, and we kind of scratch our heads a little bit. We think, we wonder, well, what were, what were they thinking? That change of attitude in itself is important, and it suggests that we are probably gradually moving away from what I would call the gem theory of historic preservation. And in fact, people started kind of trying to edge away from that very early on. For example, in New Orleans, which you see here, the French Quarter of New Orleans, and in uh, Charleston, people recognized in the 1920s and 30s that um, entire neighborhoods were valuable and needed to be protected, even though many of the actual buildings in those neighborhoods were quite ordinary. And that led to the designation of the first historic districts uh, in, in those two cities and a couple of others. And since then, We've been moving, I would say, haltingly, in small steps, little steps here and there, but over time it's, it, it looks like a significant movement that we are making away from the gem theory and towards an ever more inclusive sense of what matters and what deserves to be uh, preserved. A sense of what matters, if you're looking at an ordinary street in Buenos Aires at the moment, a sense that everything is connected and that you can't just separate foreground from background the way the designers in Philadelphia or St. Louis did. You can't just separate out the important from the unimportant. New Orleans uh, preservation scholar Catherine Barrier puts it nicely. She says, and I'm quoting, people don't experience their environment as a series of disconnected places, but rather as, again, her words, a synthesis of events, icons, sounds, smells, cultural experience, and movement in time and space. So in practical terms, this has translated itself into efforts to preserve ever larger areas, including ever more uh, mixes of ever more larger numbers of, of things that in themselves are quite ordinary. For example, in Buenos Aires. A few years ago, preservation officials there uh, decided to move a nomination to the World Heritage List. And instead of nominating the usual little chunk, which would have been 
maybe the size of that orange square up at the top, located somewhere in the old part of the city, they nominated a great big swath uh, of the city. Well, that's one example of what people are trying to do. These days, there are cultural as well as natural environmental preservationists who are trying to preserve the night sky, or at least the view of it from Earth, and you can't get much bigger than that. So, this is our theme today. The exceptional importance of the typical, uh, the extraordinary value of the ordinary. Now, my title promised that I would show you how saving, uh, how protecting these places save people and the planet. But as I thought about what I was going to say tonight, I realized, I felt that there was so much to say about people that I would let the planet take care of itself uh, at least for a few hours. So we, it, we can talk about that later maybe if there's time. But I'm going to focus on the relations between people and ordinary places uh, tonight. So let me start by trying to define what we mean by ordinary. Well, I don't mean just places whose architecture is ordinary, but whose stories are exceptional and have tremendous symbolic importance. Places like Manzanar, which you see here. These places do pose very interesting and important preservation problems. The good news is that preservationists, by and large, have recognized that they do actually matter, that those problems need to be solved, that a place like Manzanar is incredibly important, despite the fact that its architecture is, um, it, it is uh, undistinguished at wooden huts. In fact, I think California has been a leader in this movement to recognize ordinary places with extraordinary stories. I'm thinking not only of Manzanar or Tule Lake, but also of a path-breaking study that was published in, uh, here in California over 20 years ago, Five Views, an ethnic historic site survey of California. That um, survey identified as important and pinned important stories to places like this, the Kawasaki labor camp in Delano or the home of Cesar Chavez, or the home of KS, no, KG, uh, yeah, KGST uh, radio in Fresno, one of the earliest uh, Spanish, 100% Spanish language radio stations. In each case, what the Five Views survey did is take a place that looked ordinary and pin a really important story to it, a story that gave it historical importance and made it a symbolically prominent place. And this was a great step in the development of preservation and public history. But I'm talking about something in a way even more ordinary than these places. Uh, when I say ordinary places, I mean places that not only look ordinary, but aren't symbolically important. They're just places that are part and parcel of people's ordinary human habitat. So let me pose two questions about these places. First, what do these ordinary places mean to people? Why, why, why do they matter? Why are they important even though they're ordinary? And what happens to people when they lose those places, when they're either forced to leave them or the places are demolished, destroyed? So start by asking, how do people become attached to places in the first place. And it turns out that this process of becoming attached to places, forming place attachment, is a fundamental part of human development. All, all of us normal people go through it. And it starts at home. It starts with infancy. And you will, you will now see the process which we think the young John F. Kennedy took in forming, in his own personal process of forming attachments to places. So it starts, it starts with a crib, because that is the world of an infant. And then it moves a little bit beyond to the room, maybe to the bedroom, uh, to the rest of the house, and then outdoors to the front of the house, and maybe to the neighborhood. And for some of us, it goes on from there, 
and it, it extends gradually to the rest of the city to and 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 perhaps for for some of us to the to the whole world uh, there's another psychological theory not conflicting but but uh, we can kind of laminate these two theories that says that the environment around each of us serves as a kind of outer skin or an outer ring of life support systems. The inner ring is our own skin. That's what holds us inside and keeps the rest of the world out. And, and then we have clothing and, and then and we have other things. Uh, that outer ring of the environment that we live in provides physical necessities like clean water and air to breathe. But it also, um, it, it also fulfills psychosocial needs. It gives us places where we find companionship, uh, where, we f where we find other people that we can be attached to. These are places that trigger memories that we become familiar with, and they provide reference points that make us feel at home. Not just literally at home in our own house, but, but at home in this world, which is, uh, which is a difficult place sometimes to be at home in. And so people need these places. And so together, if we put these two, we laminate these two theories together, what they tell us is that this capacity to become emotionally attached to places is fundamental to our emotional development as human beings. Also, that the places we become attached to fulfill fundamental emotional needs. And also that in one way or another, the idea of home somehow remains central to this whole process. No matter how far we get away, home is, always remains at the core of our system of being attached to places in the world. So now let's look a little more closely at what place attachment really means in practice. When we get down to the, the individual human level. So the first thing that I want to emphasize, and I've seen it again and again in talking with people, is how emotional people get when they're talking about places they really care about. The second thing is that mostly the places that people get emotional about are very ordinary places, or at least places that seem to the rest of us to be very ordinary. So let me give you a couple of examples. A participant in a workshop that I ran once uh, talked about going to, back to her hometown. She hadn't been there many, many, many years. She went, the first place she went was the playground where she played as a child. There was no one there. It was late afternoon. It was deserted. But she went to the swing set and there were scuff marks under the swings. And the scuff marks told her that, that of the children who had been there. And that simple, ordinary sight brought back her whole childhood and made her feel, re revived her connection uh, to that place. Another par participant in a workshop once talked about going to Vancouver on a trip for a conference. And on a whim, she told the taxi driver coming in from the airport not to go to the hotel where the conference was being held, but to drive by a, an ice rink, uh, an ice skating rink. This was the place, it turned out, where she had dreamed, worked incredibly hard and dreamed throughout her childhood and her adolescence of one day growing up to be an Olympic skater. It didn't happen. She went in other directions. But that, that ordinary place, an ordinary skating rink, retains powerful emotional resonance, uh, resonance for her. A student of mine once wrote a beautiful essay about her great-grandmother's kitchen and how that was the center of their family life and how their family, uh, extended family, interacted with each other. The tragic thing was that she wrote this essay just in the... Um, 2004, I think it was. The house, her great grandmother's house, was in the lower ninth ward of New Orleans, and it was completely wiped out um, a year later. Another student once in a class of mine, we were talking about home and places like that, and she started describing her home and burst into tears and had to run from the room. Something, I never quite found out what had triggered this, but something about thinking about home, this was in New York, and her home was in Arkansas, triggered this powerful emotional reaction from her. And, and, and so the point is that people do get this emotional regularly. These are not exceptions. 
when they talk about the places they're really attached to. And second, that one person's nondescript place, your or my nondescript place, is, may well be the emotional center of somebody else's universe. Well, psychiatrists have various ways of explaining these feelings, as I've uh, begun to suggest, but I'd like to propose a different way of thinking about it, one that draws on a deeply American idea. That's the idea of ownership. We all hear a lot about how important it is to, and when you're a member of society to own things. Well, we all know about the usual kind of ownership that people mean when they say that. That's the kind of ownership that you have when you have the right to tell other people, keep out, private, keep out. But I don't mean uh, no trespassing. I don't mean that kind of ownership. The kind of ownership I mean is different. And I'll call it this, I'll call it effective ownership. This is the feeling that you have, that something belongs to you emotionally. It's not quite the same as thinking that it's all yours. But it, you have a grip on it, and it has a grip on you emotionally. I'll give you a personal example. Um, I, I've lived for the last 10 years in an apartment in Upper Manhattan. This is the view out of my window. I look at the George Washington Bridge every day. I've been looking at it most days for uh, quite a few days now. I see it in every kind of weather, in every kind of light, in every kind of mood that, that I have. And at some point I realized that I had made this bridge mine. I started talking. I realized I was talking to people. I said, oh, that's my bridge. Well, I didn't mean that they couldn't share it. But I meant that that bridge was something that I felt very invested in by virtue of this distant connection uh, that I had formed with it. I suspect that most of you, maybe even all of you, if you thought quietly about it, you probably have a place or more than one place somewhere that you feel invested in uh, in this way. You feel deeply hurt somehow if that place suddenly vanished. And that's what I mean by affective ownership and an ownership that comes from one's sense of affection. I like this phrase, affective ownership, for two reasons. First, because it does recognize a kind of investment that people make in places. It's not a financial investment, but it is a very real process of investment nonetheless. And second, it raises the question of whether the act of making this kind of investment should give the investor some kind of rights in the thing in which she or he has invested in. It raises the question of whether effective ownership should buy you some legal rights. And I mean legal rights. I don't mean just metaphorical rights. In other words, it raises the question of whether people's effective ownership of places should be, um, should be protected in some way. Now, obviously, effective ownership can't be the same as financial ownership. It can't and it shouldn't be. But that's not really what we're talking about uh, uh, anyway. What we are talking about is simply this question. Should people who are emotionally invested in places have some say in their future, in the future of places that are special to them, special ordinary places? by virtue of their long, deep attachment to them, even though they don't necessarily own them. Well, I said earlier that the idea of home was central to the uh, development of place attachment. And you probably noticed that most of the special places that, that I've mentioned are not only humble, but are connected in some way to the idea of home. It's not always the case. Uh, millions of people around the world feel some kind of a sense of effective ownership in the Eiffel Tower, even though they've never gotten closer to it than a postcard. But I think places like the Eiffel Tower are probably the exception. I think most people, most of the time, tend to care most about the ordinary places that are connected to their idea of home. So now coming back to that other question, what happens to people 
when you, are, when you uproot them from these special ordinary places. Uh, back in 1963, the psychologist Mark Fried was probably one of the first to actually investigate this question. He looked, he moved into Boston's West End about a year or so before it was demolished for urban renewal. And he moved there so that he could get to know people before it actually happened and then find out what the demolition of their neighborhood did to people psychologically. And very significantly, his groundbreaking study was called Grieving for a Lost Home. And the word grieving here is, is really crucial. In Fried's uh, words, residents displayed what, what he called, I'm quoting, a grief response showing most of the characteristics of grief and mourning for a lost person. He documented that people's feelings of, of loss could be, quote, again, intense, deeply felt, and at times overwhelming. And he quotes from people what, what they said to him about the loss of their home. It was like a piece being taken from me. I felt terrible. I was sick to my stomach. These were things that uh, all common reactions that people had and that Fried documented. And since then, Fried's findings have been duplicated over and over again by psychologists, psychiatrists in this country and in, and in many other places. Studying, uh, Mindy Thompson Fully Love not too long ago did a, a very in-depth study of the impacts of urban renewal on urban renewed people decades after the fact. Fried was studying it as it was happening. Fully Love studied the lasting impacts 20 or 30 or 40 years later. And what she found was that in many cases, this act of displacement, being forcibly displaced from their homes, had undercut the fundamental bonds that people felt that anchored them to, uh, in, in the world and supported their personal identity and emotional growth. And she found that some people, not everyone, some people suffered devastating and uh, lifelong harm from this, uh, from this process. So urban renewal was a, a series of programs, actually, not just one. They were in effect for about 25 years in this country, and they displaced in total about a million people. That's not good. The question is, have we or has the world learned from the experience that we had with urban renewal? And I am sorry to tell you that the answer is pretty much no. Nobody's learned anything from the lesson. Displacement and the destruction of people's homes is going on at, at a tremendous pace in many, many parts of the world. China is a big leader uh, in this. The demolition of a single urban village in the Chinese city of Shenzhen a few years ago, at one stroke, displaced 60,000 people, mostly poor and working class, all, all basically poor and, uh, and working class people. In Beijing, it's been documented that uh, a million people, a million people in Beijing were displaced by economic development schemes in a single decade, basically the 1990s. Uh, Israel has a policy of displacement. Israeli settlers displace Palestinians still doing it. And whatever you think of the politics of Israel and Palestine, this image, which shows two members of the Israeli Knesset celebrating the displacement of a Palestinian family from their home by having a nice chat on the sofa that's been removed from their home is a revolting image. Well, India is uh, another global center of displacement. The Indian author and activist Arundhati Roy has estimated that some 30 million Indians have been displaced just by big dams. Other people estimate that maybe 60 million Indians have been displaced by one form of um, economic development or, uh, or, or another. So globally, what does this all add up to? Well, in one year, uh, 1994, the UN did a study, and they estimated that around the world, 100 million people had been displaced within their own country by economic development and planning schemes. Now, to put this in perspective, the United Nations also found that 27 million people 
could be counted as political refugees around the world. So the number, according to the UN, in that one year that they studied, the number of people displaced by economic forces, development, and planning schemes within their own country is about four times the number displaced by, by um, war and, uh, and civil chaos. So that, that's the scale of the problem of displacement and the destruction of home that we're looking at around the world. So where, how about here in the United States? Have we cleaned up our act? Well, to some extent, we've, we've learned something from uh, urban renewal, but we're still contributing to the total, to the global total in other ways. So much so that, that Mindy Thompson fully loved, the psychiatrist I mentioned, has called the continuing epidemic of displacement in this country a public health crisis. Forces um, are, of displacement are familiar to most of us, planning, economic development schemes, infrastructure are big displacement factors. So is gentrification. Uh, gentrification displaces people, long-time residents. It forces them out through rising rents and, and rising property taxes. Uh, urban disinvestment is another displacement force. Disinvestment forces people out by making their habitats uh, unlivable to the point that they simply have to leave. Foreclosure. That's a new one. The foreclosure crisis, which started really with the, which was started by the uh, financial industry during the years after 2000. The foreclosure crisis really began around 2004 to 2006, peaked around 2010. Um, sometime around 2010, researchers at uh, Georgia State University in Princeton did an interesting study and they found that as the rate of people being forced to leave their homes through foreclosure rose, so did admissions to hospitals for diseases including hypertension, diabetes, and acute anxiety. Uh, so as Mindy Thompson fully loves suggests, uh, or, or hinted might be the case, foreclosures were literally making people sick. And the reasons, it's, this is one of those findings that is very surprising very striking when you look at it. And then when you think about it, you think, well, well, of course, it, that would happen. Because what are we looking at here? Well, losing your home, being forced out of your home, causes stress, anxiety, uh, guilt, and of course, increased financial pressures. Stress exacerbates hypertension and diabetes. Anxiety and guilt lead to substance abuse, alcoholism, and depression. Financial uh, pressures lead to overcrowding, malnutrition, poor health, more stress, more anxiety, more guilt, and, and so on and so on. So the foreclosure crisis, which we have not finished living through yet, uh, proved Mindy Thompson fully loves point. Displacement is still a public health crisis. I don't think anybody really knows how many people will end up being displaced by the foreclosures caused uh, by, by the by the destruction of the financial banking system, but it's certainly going to be in the millions when, when all is said and done. So what are the preservationists, what are the takeaways from this for preservation and for preservationists? Well, the most obvious is that we in preservation should obviously do everything we can to avoid displacing people, to resist displacement where we can, and, and, and at all costs to avoid causing it. But the devastating impacts that displacement has on people also tell us something else. They tell us how important those places were to people before they were displaced from them. And, and the tragic thing is that this is one of the only ways that we've, studying people who have been displaced is one of the only ways we've had of actually gauging the importance of those places. And this is because of their ordinariness. Before people lose the place that they're emotionally invested in, they tend to take it for granted. So they don't, they, people only realize how important a place is when it's taken away from them or at least threatened to be taken away. As a policy matter, this has some interesting implications. It means that if you simply go around asking people, oh, is that place important? Well, 
What about that schoolyard in your neighborhood? Is that important? You will get very misleading answers. People will sy systemically underreport their emotional investment in places because it's only the loss of them that makes them sort of sit up and take notice and stop taking these places for granted. All of which means that the problem of protecting ordinary places is not only incredibly important, but also quite challenging. And that finally, uh, that brings me to uh, my final question for this evening, which is uh, what can we do? What can we do to protect ordinary places? Well, as I mentioned earlier, preservationists and others have been pushing back against the gem theory of preservation for many years now. And over time, preservationists and planners and others have come up with some pretty interesting ways of at least evaluating and understanding and working with ordinary places. And as I'll, I'll come back to this in, in a few minutes, we really haven't translated that yet into actual policies that we can put into effect. But the conceptual tools are really all here. We have them if we just go out and look for them. And so in closing, I want to share a few of these conceptual tools that I find particularly impressive or useful with you. So let me start with a couple of what I would call very broad brush approaches to the ordinary environment. The first one uh, comes from England, and it's called Historic Landscape Characterization, HLC. This is a technique that's being used to survey entire landscapes and very large scale cityscapes. Unlike our standard traditional landmark survey, the, the, the standard landmark survey goes around, people look out the window and says, oh, that, look, that looks important. Let's take a note of that and see if that's worth saving. The typical landmark survey tries to notice the things that are exceptional and different, the things that stand out. Unlike that, the premise of historic landscape characterization is an attempt to understand what, what the English people who do this call the overall character of the neighborhood in its totality, including, and I'm quoting here again, the everyday places that are the backdrop of ordinary urban and rural life. So an, a historic landscape characterization survey, when it's all done, begins to look kind of like a mosaic. Each little piece has its own separate character, maybe a little bit different, similar or different from the pieces next to it. The point isn't that this one is good and that one's less good, but each one represents a different kind of character, a different mix of buildings and public spaces, different mix of uh, stories and traditions. And it's important to note here that the researchers who do this don't just go around looking at things. They don't rely just on visual impressions. They set up public meetings and discussions. They go talk to people and they, and they listen. They try to get an understanding of how the people who live in a place understand it. And that's uh, really critically important. The second technique that I want to mention comes from France. This is uh, an intriguing set of tools. We'll, we'll call it by two different names, ambiance and marche, or in English, ambiences and walks. It's that simple. Some, some years ago, some French architectural researchers got interested in the, in the question of sonic ambiences and how places sound. I don't know quite what led them to that uh, interesting idea of something to study. But they've developed some very sophisticated ways of recording and analyzing the sonic ambience of places. And I had the good fortune of following one of these researchers around the uh, city of Bogota, the capital of uh, Colombia, as he did some research on ambiance uh, a few years ago. And uh, here, here he is. Here is Professor Tixier, the person leaning over the museum. With the sandals. That's, that's your basic French architecture professor right there. And, oh no, what did I do? I did, oh no, I did just what I wasn't supposed to do. What do we do now? You told me not to do it and I did it. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. No, it's here. Ken. It's oh, that's one. okay. And this one came out too? Yeah, but we lost the picture. Hold on, everybody. Yeah. No, great. That with both tablers. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, okay. Can you see it? Yes, I will. Yeah, there we go. All right. Okay. Sorry, um, sorry about that. Let's not forget that part. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, my, my fault totally. So, so there is um, uh, Professor Tixie, and it looks like he's just tuning up his uh, Walkman or, 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 I, or iPod or whatever it is, and he's got a pair of earphones in his ears, uh, except they're not earphones, they're microphones. <laughs> he's actually got microphones stuck in his ears recording, but he looks like he's just a member of the crowd, and he's actually tuning dials on his very high-tech and, and uh, um, tape recorder. So now let me play you just a couple of minutes, if I can find it here on the desktop, of the recording that, uh, this is what this little plaza in Bogota sounds like. goes on like that. It's kind of it's kind of mesmerizing. Absolutely nothing uh, nothing important happens. Uh, um, so, but it's a whole world. It's a whole world that's out there that we're that we we're usually unaware of when we're relying on our eyes. And so, researchers like Tixier are using sound partly to broaden their perception and their, and their ability to analyze what's happening in places, but also to connect with the ordinary aspects of everyday places, those, the, the aspects that we tend to not notice when we're looking around for something that, that really stands out. There's, I think, a kind of specifically French intellectual tradition at work there, and um, It, um, does anyone know the, the, he's always referred to as an experimental writer, the experimental writer, <gasps> Georges Perec? God bless you. Georges Bataille. Well, yes. No, Georges Perec. Georges Perec. Yes, yeah. George Perec. Yes, let's stop. Yeah. Yeah. Life and user's manual. Yes, yes right. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. We have a Perec fan. <laughs> the, the world is divided into, into passionate fans of Georges Perec and people who have never heard of him and probably you know, could care less. But in 1970-something, um, 75, George Perrick published this really interesting little book, An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris. Well, this book has, uh, has no plot, and, and it has no characters. Instead, Perrick just sits in the window of a cafe in Paris. That's the cafe where he sat in the window. And he just takes notes on, um, on what is going on outside the window day after day for about a week. So let me read you a, a passage chosen completely uh, at random. A half full 96 goes by. New lights turn on in the cafe. Outside, the dusk is at its height. A 63 goes by, full. A man goes by, pushing his Solex. A 70 goes by, full. A half full 96 goes by. Extra fresh eggs NB goes by. It is five to six. A man took out a dolly from a blue van, loaded it with different cleaning products, and pushed it down Rue de Canet. Outside, you can barely even make out the faces anymore. Colors blend, 
a grayness that is rarely lit, yellow patches, reddish glows. An almost empty 96 goes by. A police car goes by and turns in front of the church square. An empty 86 and a moderately full 87 go by. The bells of saint Sulpice begin to ring. A full 70, an empty 96, another 96 even emptier. Open umbrellas. Motor vehicles turn on their headlights. And so on, and so on, day after day. Well, so these are the kinds of things that Parrot takes notice of. But here's the interesting thing. This is what he was actually looking at. This is the, the spectacular, magnificent Baroque church, Baroque and neoclassical church of Saint-Sulpice in France, one of the great architectural monuments uh, of Paris. And across, it, and there's the Fountain of the Four Cardinals, uh, another important work of sculpture, right in front of the cafe. And there's the, the local mayory of the fourth arrondissement, an important work by an important 19th century architect. And, and, and a few other things in the square as well. So the Place Saint-Sulpice is really a remarkable place if you want to sit down and look at great architecture sometime. But the point is that Perrick ignores, you have to make a special effort to ignore these things if you're sitting in that cafe on the Place Saint-Sulpice, and Perrick does ignore them. And instead, he forces himself to notice the, the, uh, the incidental details of everyday life. And that's what researchers like Tixier, in, in part, I think, uh, are trying to do. Not only through recordings, through sound recordings and videos, uh, but also through the second technique I mentioned, which is to walk, the idea of a marsh or um, a walk. So what they do is they set up routes through whatever neighborhood they're studying, and they walk them. They, they call the routes transects, a word which also appears in in a similar English language projects. And along the way, they talk to people, they talk to whoever they meet, the shop owners, the pedestrians, uh, the, the policemen, whoever it is, they talk to people, they watch what the people are doing, and they document it all with photographs, video, sound recordings, uh, diagrams, and descriptions. And sometimes, uh, when you look at their, the, the, what they produce, and you can have a look at this later, you know, it's a little bit like Perrick's book. There's really no obvious point to it. You wonder, well, you know, it's a bunch of this guy and that guy, and this is happening, and the other thing is happening. Well, what's the point? Well, that is the point, in a way. The, the point is that there is no obvious point. The, the point is that you really have to come to grips with, with, the, with the texture uh, and, the, and the very ordinariness of the place. Once you do that, that can help you to understand it in a very full and deep way. And once you do that, then you can begin to derive, one hopes, intelligent planning decisions, preservation design decisions from, from that process of study and immersion. But there's no shortcut. You can't get to the moral just by picking out what seems, uh, what seems important. So maybe the fundamental lesson here is that um, ordinary people and their ordinary everyday places really do matter and, and deserve our, our effort to, uh, to become immersed and understanding. So um, we move now to the United States and to a really wonderful concept, which we'll call, after the, uh, the inventor of this concept, sacred structure. Anyone familiar with where I'm going with this? Okay, good, then, it, then it'll be nice to you. Uh, some years ago, I think it's back in the 80s, a planner and uh, landscape architect, Randolph Hester, was asked by the mayor of Manteo, seaside town of Manteo, in North Carolina, to devise an economic development plan. Well, like many other similarly situated towns, the economy of Manteo was kind of just gradually collapsing. Economic life was draining out of the place. But unlike so many other economic planners and designers, Hester didn't propose just some kind of drop-down economic solution, an aquarium, uh, an, an outlet mall, a convention hotel, or, or anything like that. 
And so he just started hanging out at the diner and down at the dock, at the town dock, and just started talking to people and then began to observe their patterns of activity and what they did. And what he found was that while people did want economic development, because people do need to make a livelihood in this world, they didn't want it at any price. There were some places they just cared so much about that they were not willing to lose them, even if holding on to them meant sacrificing an economic development opportunity. And after many, many meetings with local residents um, to, to it, discussing these things, one resident, to describe this feeling they had, came up with the term sacred structure, the phrase sacred structure. So the places that people cared most about in Mantio, that they were most unwilling to sacrifice, became known in the local parlance as the sacred structure of Mantio. So what were these sacred places? Well, uh, it turned out that residents didn't, um, didn't care all that much about the architecturally significant landmarks that were listed on the National Register. They didn't care so much about the 19th century church or the birthplace of somebody, I forget who. What, what they really cared about was the local diner, the ice cream shop, the town dock where they all hung out, even a parking lot where teenagers like to hang out and you know, be, be with each other. These were places that, had, that were really at the heart, uh, wo deeply woven into the social fabric of the town. And as um, in Hester's words, these were humble, homey, and homely places. These were the places that people really cared about and were willing, in a sense, to, 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 to lay their lives down for. Hester tried to take note of these to protect them in his economic development plan. And over time, he, he had some success in that. But the truth was, as, as he himself pointed out, there, there really wasn't much that he or anybody else could do to assure that these places would be protected. He, he noted at the time that only five of the 17 places that residents said they cared most about qualified for protection under the preservation, national, local, state preservation or zoning laws. Now today, they're, they're probably, we, we, the number would probably be a bit higher than five, but, uh, but not much. I just don't know why, why we preservationists haven't taken up Hester's methods and his insights, because I think they're just so, so inspiring and important. But the fact is, we still really haven't, so we still could. Another approach that's still waiting for adoption uh, we'll call third places. Um, th this is a, a term that was invented by a sociologist named Ray Oldenburg. According to Oldenburg, uh, the, a third place is a place that's not home, that's your first place, and it's not work that's your second place. It's a third place where you go to do something um, useful to buy a book or a cup of coffee or something like that, but also to hang out with people, to, to be sociable with people who are not necessarily your best friends, but, but in some way are part of your community and, uh, and are maybe most likely neighbors, at least in a loose sense. So third places tend to be places where local news gets exchanged. They, they tend to be neighborhood uh, places. And third places, as Oldenburg defines them, seem to be places um, that, that affirm that sense of identity and belonging that, as I said earlier, people seem to crave so much from the environment. Now, third places look different um, in, depending on the local context, so there's no rule for identifying them. But let me nominate a few from my own experiences and travels. In, uh, in the Bronx, in New York, in the a mostly Puerto Rican neighborhood in the Bronx, is a record, now a, a CD store, called uh, Casa Amadeo. This was a center for the development and diffusion of salsa music over many, many decades. So it's a place not only that records or CDs got sold, 
but also where musicians and fans would come and talk about the latest uh, news and about the thing that they, the music that they cared about. Maybe DeLuca's restaurant in Pittsburgh is the third place. Judging from the crowd on a Sunday morning, it, it might be that kind of place. Uh, res researchers in Los Angeles have documented the importance of small Asian markets, food markets for the Filipino community, not only as places to buy culturally appropriate food, but also to, uh, to exchange uh, local news. Uh, what about the Silver Spur in Ranchester, Wyoming? Is that a third place or is it just a place where people go at night to shoot pool and drink a little too much and wish their lives were different. Uh, I spent a long evening there, I, and I suspect it might be both. I'm pretty sure that the coffee pot in Walden, Colorado, used to be a third place. I visited there several times. I was always treated courteously. But there, I was under no illusion about the fact that I was an outsider. The real action was taking place at a table sort of in the center of the room, and that's where all the regulars sat. The, the, the local farmers, the ranchers, the crop insurance salesmen, the farm equipment repair company people and whatever. And this went on every day, you know, every week for uh, years and years and years. Now the irony is that this uh, authentically ordinary, authentically deeply, profoundly Western cafe was replaced a few years ago. That's the owner, by the way, uh, by this, by a phony, by a phony, authentic, inauthentic imitation of a traditional Western cafe, themed in, in sort of National Park Lodge uh, style. So now the question is, where do the regulars go now? I doubt that they feel very comfortable in there, but uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Anyway, the point about third places is, um, once again, how often real profound social value hides behind an ordinary facade. These places don't show up in historic resource surveys, at least not yet. They don't show up in environmental impact assessments. In each case, you have to go talk to people and you have to watch what they're doing to figure out why they're important or even whether they're important. In short, you have to learn their stories. And that brings me to the last of the techniques that I want to share with you. And this one is called Storyscape. And I know it's called Storyscape because I invented it. And so I called it that. And Storyscape is based on a simple idea that, the, that as I've been sort of hinting from the beginning, that the stories people tell you about places uh, that, they, that they care about uh, um, are, are really important, that, that, they are, that they are deeply revealing of, the, of what, they, uh, what they care about in the physical environment. As I said earlier, asking people straight out what places are important to them and how much doesn't work. So Storyscape is a kind of workaround, and it works for this very reason, because people, re people can reach um, a, a, a level of emotion, emotional involvement when they talk about stories which they do not verbalize easily in other ways or, or at all in other ways. Actually, this brings me to a topic. I want to digress for a minute on the, about the topic of language. We have all the pseudoscientific language in our discipline. We talk about authenticity and integrity. We talk about the criteria. And then we talk about the exceptions to the criteria. And all of this technical pseudoscientific language is a big impediment to what we're trying to do. It's anti-democratic. And it's one of the big reasons why we in preservation or heritage conservation have trouble connecting with the public very often. Our language is off-putting, to, to put it simply, but it's worse than off-putting. Social researchers have shown that many people, including most poor people, not only don't want to use this language, but literally cannot use this language. It's not because they're not smart enough. It's because it's not part of their culture. 
this language that we use of assessing quality and then assigning it to categories and exceptions and so forth, this is part of what linguists call the formal register. Linguists define five registers of speech. The top register, the most formal is, is set pieces like the Lord's Prayer or, or what you say when you're getting married. Just below that is the formal register. This is a very careful uh, thought through way of talking that we have and, and that we use in our profession. But the most, many, many people's culture, especially poor people, do not include the use of the formal register. We just, it's not there. So when we insist on saying our most important things about what we do in this formal register, we are automatically excluding people, even though we didn't say we wanted to do that and probably sincerely don't want to do that. But we are automatically making what we do elitist. By contrast, when, uh, when, when we talk about stories, we talk in a language that everyone understands and speaks naturally. Uh, the, the Hawaiians uh, like to use the phrase to talk story. And when we talk story, we are talking a language that everyone instinctively is comfortable with. So what do we mean by stories? Well, first of all, stories are not necessarily just anecdotes. They're not even necessarily just verbal. Uh, traditions are a form of story, too. A tradition is a story that you tell by acting it out and reacting and reenacting it. This woman, this mother, at the right edge of the screen, is acting out the story of taking her son to the farmer's market in Eugene, Oregon, by taking her son to the farmer's market in Eugene, Oregon. And someday that little boy may well tell the same story to his children. Uh, and this kind of storytelling through reenactment of tradition is happening all over the country in, a, in, a, in innumerable ways every day. In Green River, Wyoming, people tell the story of going to church every Sunday by going to church every Sunday. In New York, people tell the story of going to the Feast of San Gennaro uh, every fall by going to the Feast of San Gennaro uh, every fall. Um, re remembering. So, so tradition is, uh, is a way of telling a story and somehow all of the big and little, little rituals of our lives in this way become stories that we tell and retell. So that's one way of telling a story that, that's not just uh, verbally producing it. Remembering a story is another way to tell it. And in fact, one of the key things that places do for us is help us to remember stories. Places are mnemonic devices. And any of you who've lived in a place for a long time know this, that when you have lived in a place for a very long time, it becomes for you your own personal mosaic of stories uh, uh, that are associated with the, with, with the place. You can go here, and that's the place where you said goodbye to your first boyfriend or girlfriend. This is the place where you used to take your daughter for ice cream or corn muffins. This other place is, is some place where you remember feeling happy, and another is a place where you remember feeling sad, and on and on and on. The whole environment that you've lived in becomes invested in the recollection of your own, uh, your own stories. And so remembering stories is one of the ways that we build up our personal attachment to or investment in places. We make them our own through, by pasting our own stories on them and using them to remember them. And this is why uh, this point about recollection and remembering is one reason why schools figure so importantly in people's uh, sort of collection of places that, that they anchor themselves to. Why people will often fight for the preservation of a school even after it's become functionally obsolete uh, as a school. Schools are community anchors that, uh, that, that anchor people to place over generations but that also anchor people's memories of their own childhood. One of the great Western writers, uh, however, said this best. Uh, I'm referring to A.B. Guthrie, the author of the, uh, the Big Sky, one of the first really great fundamental uh, Western novels. And Guthrie gets in the mind of his hero, who's a trapper up in the Northwest, uh, Oregon or 
uh, Montana, I, I, if I remember correctly. And, and he says, um, thinking in the, in the voice of this uh, trapper who's now aging and recalling his uh, youth, half the pleasure of returning to a familiar place, the trapper says in his mind, is in the remembering mind. And let me read you the rest of this passage of uh, Guthrie. A place didn't stand alone after a man had been there once. It stood along with the times he had had, with the thoughts he had thought, with the men he had played and fought and drunk with. So when he got there again, he was always asking, whatever became of so-and-so? Asking if the others minded a certain time. It stood with the young him and the former feelings. A river wasn't the same once a man had camped by it. The tree he saw again wasn't the same tree if he had even so much as pissed against it. There was the first time and the place alone, and afterwards there was the place and the time and the man he used to be all mixed up, one with another. So storyscape is one way, an attempt to capture that richness of meaning and experience that people bring to places through long inhabitation. So, to, to wrap up now, I started by making a big claim that saving ordinary places helps save people. And, and I hope now that in closing, that claim doesn't sound quite so outlandish anymore. We've seen that people form deep emotional places, uh, emotional attachments to places. We've seen that the places they get attached to are often mostly very ordinary, everyday places. We've seen that these places are often or mostly connected in some way with the idea of home, neighborhood, hometown, sense of security, uh, being belonging in the world. And we've seen that people can be devastated by the loss of these places. So in all of these ways, saving these ordinary places really does save people. Which brings me finally back to the question of preservation. Where are we? Where are we in heritage conservation or preservation? Well, the bad news, as I mentioned, is that we, our discipline started out with the idea of identifying the things that weren't ordinary, that were special and different, and focusing on them. We've moved past that to some extent, but to a considerable extent, we're still there. Now, the problem, of course, is not that special places don't deserve protection anymore. Obviously, they do. The problem is that by making specialness, exceptional or uniqueness, the essential criterion for preservation, we've lost our ability to connect with the rest of the environment and, and with, the, with the world that we live in, in in a deep and comprehensive way. We've, uh, we've made it hard to see how places are connected uh, amongst themselves. We've made it hard for us to recognize the multiple values and meanings that places have to people. We've made it hard to recognize the, the exceptional values that lie in really ordinary places. And we've made it hard for ourselves to work on behalf of the real needs that real people have from their cultural environment. Now the good news is that we can change this. And in fact, as I said, people have been pushing back in a tentative way against this gem theory of preservation for a long time. And they've been doing so in ever more kind of bold and creative ways, as I think some of these examples will, will show you. Real change will not be easy. The, uh, the ways of preservation are deeply entrenched, and any effort to change them is going to be fiercely uh, resisted. But beyond that, we have another challenge here, which is that toppling the old ways is not, is, is not enough. We need to replace the old standards and criteria with new ones that work better, and we don't have those yet. As I said earlier, I think we have all of the fundamental conceptual understanding we need, but we haven't turned that yet into workable, bureaucratic, and I use the word in, a, in its literal and, and, in fact, admiring sense. We need standards and guidelines and criteria that people working in offices with responsibilities can, can, can live by and apply in regular and fair ways. Designing those standards, guidelines, criteria is going to be a big job, but I think it's a really important one. And the good news, again, is that we have, we have a lot of conceptual material that we can begin to work with. So in a year and a half or so, in 2016, 
we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of the National Historic Preservation Act. And essentially with that, the 50th anniversary of our whole fundamental preservation system. And there will be lots of celebrations, lots of patting each other on the back, and lots of saying how much we've achieved and how great everything is. But I hope that this upcoming celebration will also inspire us, you, and all of us, to get serious about creating the new frameworks that we need to do preservation for the heritage conservation for the next 50 years. We should make 2016 our deadline for crafting the practical preservation tools, the policies, the guidelines, standards, the programs that we need to protect the really extraordinary prizes that lie in ordinary places. So thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, actually, actually we should. I mean, I'm not being um, completely flipped. No, literally, we shouldn't save everything. There are lots of things that are bad and should be replaced or improved. But I think what we do need is, uh, is we, need to, we need to get a lot beyond. You see, one of the problems we have now is, is that our, our legal system for dealing with the environment is bifurcated. We have all the agencies that deal with helping development to happen and promoting change, that's planning departments and so on and so forth. And then we have this little thing over on the side called preservation or heritage conservation, which is configured as the thing which is there to stop change. And that, that's a very constricting role for us. It's not fair to put us in that role since we in heritage conservation actually do a lot more than just try to stop change. But we have very limited tools to work with the environment. So yes, I think we need um, we need we need policies that allow us to work much more someone to work much more broadly to stabilize the not just the special things but the larger large patches of the environment that we live in I doubt that that's going to be preservation groups or preservation agencies it might someday be planning or environmental um, agencies I go back to a phrase that, that the English psychiatrist Hugh Freeman used um, years ago when he called for a, the psychological conservation of the environment. And, and that's really what we, we still need, wherever it comes from. I don't, I don't and, and so, so yes, I think, um, and, and one other thing I'd add to that is we, uh, our culture is, we, in, in our culture we are bombarded with the news constantly about how good new things are for us, uh, about how good progress is and change. It's very hard to frame the argument for why some things are better the way they are. And not only that, why stability, why non-change is actually in many cases a positive virtue. So we need to have a language and a way of arguing for non-change as, as a positive environmental plan. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Um, I wonder what organization would you say could lead the, the charter for rethinking the criteria and meeting that 2016 deadline? Well, it's interesting that it's a very interesting question. Um, I've actually been trying to get some organizations lined up behind that idea. And I am, am in fact finding it very difficult. I, I would not, for example, think to look to the National Park Service. No offense to the Park Service. I love my colleagues there. I love much of what they do. But clearly you can't expect people who are part of a system to, uh, to be the, sp the spearhead for turning it upside down. So if this is true of many of the, the sort of big central organizations that we have in, in the field. I think universities could. I think universities could spearhead it. And, and, I, and I would hope that, that, that that's what will 
um, what will happen. But it, and it shouldn't be just us preservation, heritage conservation folks talking. We need to bring in, uh, we need to have a, a multidisciplinary conversation about the environment. So we need, we need planners and geographers, psychiatrists, um, you make, sociologists, make up your own list. But, but I think that maybe some of our programs in historic preservation and heritage conservation could spearhead that. And if you have a better idea, I would love to hear it, <laughs> or any other idea. No, I mean, it's something out in the field that you do hear people talk about, especially yeah. in small towns where they do preservation and never bother with the criteria, and they don't even know what it is, they can't speak it, they don't understand it, yeah. so they just jettison it, they do their own thing. And what you find sometimes in doing their own thing is exactly what you're talking about. They tend to lead towards the places that the community grabs onto and cares yeah. about Right. And then, you know, also from the LA Conservancy point of view, they're struggling with really looking at uh, some of these issues, exactly what you're saying, place, how do you place um, beyond historic neighborhoods? And is the model about um, creating an alternative way of conceptualizing preservation? Because we can't, we can't live in peace with it. And yet we know this place has such important value. So right. Yeah, really yeah. well, thank you for that um, uh, uh, contribution. Um, I have a question about how to fully form the best, I guess, for What are you thinking of specifically, just so I know? When you were talking about the coffee shop, for example, that was part of the larger community, yeah. okay. um, so important yeah. to um, maybe the majority of people yeah. who are larger people in an area. And I was thinking about this idea of effective ownership mm -hmm. and sort of competing interests between the owner of a real property and a smaller minority that might have some sort of effective ownership over the, I mean, I guess maybe I'm thinking more in like uh, Native American sort of situation yeah. where the developer is trying to develop on a piece of land. Very relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering sort of what extent or what the argument would be. So, so what what extent of effective effective ownership do you think would create a legitimate argument for saving a place when maybe most of the people in the area are interested? Well, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, this is why we, we have to really have this set of conversations in an intensive way. Because I think um, through talking about it, we will begin to arrive, and, and floating proposals and critiquing, we'll begin to arrive at some answers to some workable answers to that question. I know that sounds like an evasion, but um, we just, we, we really don't know. What I would say is that in a way you've, in an interesting way, you've kind of stacked the deck with your, with the, with the hypothetical example that you chose, where most residents are in favor of developing the place. Do we know whether what's the, mo the more typical situation where most residents would be in favor or not? We don't, we don't really know. Um, and so what level of effective ownership would guarantee a right? Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. But I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that there are many different kinds of rights that people can have in a place. And also that the whole concept of legal rights is we, we create it, we as a society, and we change it from time to time. Some obvious examples, um, women didn't used to have the right to vote. It was a right that at one point 
people thought was unimaginable. They literally didn't imagine it. Then it happened. Uh, children, rights of children and infants are very much under discussion now. And one, one could come up with thousands, literally thousands, I think, of examples. So we're not, so when we talk about creating legal rights in property, we're, we're not talking about something subversive. Uh, we're, we're talking about an evolution of the, of the constant process of creating and negotiating rights. Rights in property that people don't own already do exist. For example, there are places where, well, in my city, some tenants um, under, in some buildings under certain conditions have a right to have their rent not raised more than a certain percentage, which is set by a government body every year. It's called rent control, in some cases rent stabilization and others. And, and I happen to have a rent stabilized apartment. So I have, that, I have that right. I don't own the apartment, but my right to, uh, uh, to have a, a limitation put on the rent is a, is, a, is a legal right that I have in that property. It, it, it's very common for tenants to have a right to have an apartment heated to a certain temperature in the winter, problem that probably doesn't much concern you in Los Angeles, but does in places like Toronto and, uh, and also New York. Uh, people have the right to part to when they form a community group, let's say a, a community board in New York, to have a certain kind of say about policies. It may be only an advisory say. So there's, there's a whole panoply of tenant rights and community rights that we could begin to work with to, and, then, and then begin to calibrate. You know, how much, how much of a say do people get? Do they get a say individually or do they get a say as a group? as all of the tenants of a building. I don't know, let's, let's talk about it, figure it out. I, I would just like to make a comment. I am a displaced person from urban renewal. Hmm. Right, right there, Gordon. I, I grew up on Bunker Hill, downtown Los Angeles, in the 1940s, 50s, and into the 60s, and we owned some property down there. My earliest childhood memories were Bunker Hill. Um, and all you say about the emotional investment that you have in that memory and that place is absolutely real. Hmm. The um, affective ownership, absolutely real. Huh. And I feel like I have, we had property rights there. We did own some property, but I have an emotional right to that place that was taken away from me. Yeah. Um, there is a seat on Angel's Flight which still exists down there. The Vulcan Cave seat in the back, that's my seat. Because I sat there as a child. Yeah. Um, and it's all gone. It was, there was a lot of propaganda at the time that it was a slum. It was not. Right. But it was coveted by the city and they took it. Um, and it's a radicalizing experience when that happens to you. Um, and it creates an emotional void that cannot be assuaged. Uh, you go through all the stages of anger and loss, Disbelief. sadness, grief, yeah. everything. And what's left is this emotional void that you can't assuage. It just stays with you the rest of your life. Huh. I don't want to say anything. I just want to let that resonate. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's absolutely real. But on the day that yeah. the CRAs were dissolved, you went to the city council and you pulled them. You was there and remembered and expressed that it was beautiful. All, all the people that were displaced are gone now. Yeah. And we're told that they were going to put low cost housing back so they could move back there. It never happened. Right, right. A whole other set of, of issues related to displacement is the the broken promises that, that the government has used to get people out. Yeah, well, thank you for that um, te first hand testimony. I appreciate that. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that we should have conversations at this point because I do want to let people go if they want to. Um, so, if you need to leave, please feel free to do so. But um, I invite you to stay and have further conversations. Uh, and to enjoy some of the food and things like that. But I wanted to thank Dr. Coffin for coming and making everybody think pretty hard about what's going on and what we're doing well and what we're maybe doing, could be doing better. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you all.